a transition from that which is ordinarily bad to that which is extraordinary. In other words, what we are being told that politics happens at the level of the extraordinary. And it is this level of extraordinary that we are defining our notion evil. How to be evil? First, what we've said is that we qualify and define our notion of morality beyond what is ordinarily bad. And we go to the third level of what we are calling extraordinary, that is the zone of the evil. So, our notion of evil here, again, must be, in a sense, secularized. We are not talking of evil vis-a-vis -vis God and Satan. We are not talking about God and Satan. We are not talking about uh, holy and unholy. But we are talking about a moral type. We are talking about a moral scenario which is beyond the ex I mean beyond the ordinary and that which we are calling extraordinary. To start thinking with us is Frederick Nietzsche. Frederick Nietzsche writes a book. And the title of the book is Beyond Good and Bad. And in this book, Beyond ba Good and Bad, Frederick Nietzsche argues that what is important is that when you think in terms of good and evil, that has been the classical tradition, then you are limited to ascending to political power. Because political power is outside the idea of good and bad. Now, let me demonstrate. The concern of good would make you a bit moderate. Because you want to be seen good. The concern about evil will make you moderated because you fear to be evil. And we've already defined, we've already, in a sense, conceptualized our idea about evil, that which is extraordinary. A morality that, an immoral act that is extraordinary. So, Nietzsche, or Frederick Nietzsche, in the book, Beyond Good and Evil, argues that the space of a politics is value neutral. You don't have to be good. You don't have to be evil. Why? Because the thoughts of goodness would, in a sense, limit your ascendance to power. And the thought of bad or evil also limits your ascendance to power. And the power is talking about is political power. And so what Nietzsche says is that he who needs power must transcend anything called good, any value that is so said good or qualified as good, and that which is immoral and qualified, we've already said that the extra uh, uh, ordinary uh, immoral uh, character, what we are calling evil, moving and transcending good and evil. Because his concern is power.
He who wants power must move beyond good. You are not supposed to be thanked. You are not supposed to be appreciated that what you are doing is good. Because concern of being thanked, the concern of being good, will keep you in the good zone. And the concern of being evil, that people will blame me, people will complain, people will mark me as evil, will also contain you. The fear of being evil contains you. And once you are contained, then you cannot ascend to power. So what do you have to do? Transcend notions, transcend sensitivities, transcend consciousness around good and evil. And once you can move beyond that which is good, if you can move beyond that which is considered evil, then you are the right person for politics. You are the right person for power. And a part of the concern that, that it tells us is the idea that for you to transcend good and evil, you must kill God. The idea of killing God is a heuristic representation of deconstructing and then consciousness around morality so that then what is left of you is one who is hungry for political power. The killing of God is heuristic. It's not the physical killing of God, but that you must relieve yourselves from the concerns of religion. Relieve yourselves from the concerns around God. And so is notorious the phrase, the death of God. God must die. God must be killed. And once God has died, God has been killed, you are ready for politics, you are ready for power. And now you qualify to be called a superman. <laughs> In German is Obermensch. Obermensch is the idea of the superman. He whose eyes is focused beyond what is good, beyond what is bad. He has no considerations for these value-limiting spaces. Because the consideration of good will make you not do wrong. And the considerations of fear around wrong would create some timidity around you. And you are not going to ascend to power. Power requires that. Nietzsche observes that he has sent some cold shocks and he wants to redeem you from this. And he says, values, this idea about good and this idea about bad is not natural. It is human constructed. It is constructs. Good is a construct. Bad is a construct. It is not natural and it is not divine. At a certain point in time, and this is his idea of the genealogy of morality, that the concept of good or evil grew in the historical time of ancient Greek, in the Christian values, Christianity, and in Judaism. 
Ancient Greek, Judaism, and Christianity popularized a certain value of life and living and made them look as though they are natural. And Nietzsche argues none of these are natural, they were man-made. And that man has created these values for that time when human mind was still predisposed to simple uh, values, accepting values at that rudimentary level. Now the human mind has civilized, has gained more consciousness. And it is time to break loose because that was slave morality. Ancient Greek morality that we presented in the book, The Republic of Plato, Virtue, Wisdom, Moderation, and on and on, together with the Christian morality of thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not uh, uh, lustfully look at your uh, uh, friend's wife, and on and on and on, in his view, was slave morality. It limited position of a power, it limited individuals becoming supermen. And since these were not natural values, but man-made, it was time to transcend. Nietzsche argues that he seems to have succeeded telling you and I that what we thought were natural values are not. They are man-made. They are constructed. And over time, it was now clear that they were dangerous to human vitality. They were now dangerous to human movement upwards towards power. It was crowd morality. It was slave morality. But, he wants to think about a master. He wants to think about a master. He wants to think about a politician. He wants to think about this person who has a drive to power. A drive for power. And so, the transition in his mind was that now I need to recreate a new type of value a value that is uh, expanding the traditional or ancient morality to give way for his master. A new master value as opposed to a slave value. And that master should have a will to power, should become a superman. And that led him to reject all moral values. In a technical sense, we would call that a situation of nihilism. There's nothing good, there's nothing bad. All these were human constructs to control. But now, you have to ascend. You don't have to be controlled. And you must relieve yourselves from all this. In fact, what was seen as evil for as long as can help you to achieve your ends are good. Nothing is evil in itself, provided it helps you to achieve by catapulting you to the top. But Nietzsche, or Frederick Nietzsche, 
only learned from another master thinking. As we say, his book, Beyond Good and Evil, and the genealogy of morality, and particularly Beyond Good and Evil, which I would recommend that you read, was written in 1886. Shortly before that, there was a masterpiece, Leviathan, by Thomas Holtz. And Thomas Holtz understood the same thing Nietzsche later on understood. Holtz starts from this point that the world we live in is an evil world already. It is a world of struggle. It is a world of survival for the fittest. It is not a heavenly world. And those who should live in this world are those who are ready to survive. In this world, you don't have angels. You have human beings who are paying for your blood, who want to take advantage of your innocence, who want to amass as much as possible for themselves. A world, therefore, that is chaotic. A world in which each is struggling with the other. It is a brutal world. A nasty world. A chaotic world. And in this chaos, you are not going to preach. In this chaos, you are not going to apply this so-called traditional ancient Greek, Judaic, and Christian values. You have to step outside and recreate new values, values that are not limited by the idea of good and evil. And so, in the Leviathan, pretty much akin to the traditional concept of OBB or an hydra, something scary. Thomas Hobbes then said, for stability to be maintained, for order to return, he is desirous that this sovereign, this Leviathan, this king, this president, this emperor, this political leader must enforce a certain submission from the subject. And that submission, he calls it surrender. People must surrender unto thee. The Christian notion of surrender was that we surrender to Christ Jesus as the sovereign. Paul secularizes Jesus to this king, to this prince. And so he suggests that we should surrender to this king, to this uh, uh, politician. And until we've surrendered, we may not see order but chaos. And it is in the surrendering that some level of civilization, some level of order comes. And once we've surrendered, it is now at the mercy of the sovereign, at the mercy of the king, to decide what is best for us. And once you've surrendered, you don't have rights, you don't have freedom, you don't have to complain. He knows what is good for you. He knows what is bad for you. And he must lead with an iron hand. And he calls him a sovereign leading with an iron hand. The figure, the metaphor 
of an iron hand is simply the idea of being evil. Namely, everything possible is allowed to create some amount of order, some amount of uh, compliance. But, slightly before that, as we said, Leviathan was published in 1652. Slightly before that, Niccolo Machiavelli had already, as a pioneering uh, thinker, thought through. And 1532, he handed down to the world a masterpiece that has been famed as The Prince. Machiavelli argues, I am not theorizing. I am telling you practical politics. I have been in politics as the foreign secretary of Florence. I have known, I have seen, I have experienced what the politicians do and what politics and power does. And from a very practical perspective, I'm going to tell you what politics is. But much more important is, is a sharp look into not the general content of a politics, but the politician, the prince. You could have said the emperor or the king. At the time of his writing, Italy or Rome had collapsed into princedoms. The prince of Florence, the prince of uh, Sicily, the prince of uh, Rome, and on and on. So he's now talking to the prince. The equivalent is the king, the equivalent is the president. And in that case, he is ambivalent towards evil. Evil is not a language that deploys. It only deploys evil as an instrument to power, not as a moral concept. And whereas he has been blamed, one of the people who blamed him is Leo Strauss, who would remark that Machiavelli was in effect a teacher of evil. But Leo Strauss was an academic. And then came Benito Mussolini. Mussolini was a practical politician. And he saw in the prince something. And he said, indeed, the prince is the man of government. In other words, it is the handbook for he who wants to manage government. Machiavelli has had the famous adjective Machiavellianism or Machiavellian. When we say you are Machiavellian, we are saying you behave in a certain way outside. Uh, the conventional way of behaving as a public officer. Machiavellian is negative through and through. But at the same time, it is a technique of governing. And the Machiavellians are growing day by day in number. So we've said Machiavellian is a famous adjective which is essentially negative, but it's also a technique of governing, a technique of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of a political uh, uh, power play. And for those like Mussolini, who are more practical towards politics and not academic, 
overappreciated. That is a handbook for he who wants to govern, the man of government. Whatever our feelings, Machiavelli was clear. And when you focus on chapter 17, chapters 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, chapter 22, chapter 21, chapter 20, you have the central discussion of the prince. Allow me to talk, uh, isolate a few cases here. The prince, in chapter 7, observes that humans are generally ungrateful. Humans are pretenders. Humans are self-seekers. He who thinks the person saying thank you to him is a genuine appreciation will easily lose its power. Because if you go to him poor and you gave him some money, he's now a millionaire. He will not stop. He's still a self-seeker who will wish to become a billionaire. And if the reason for his riches is because you are in power, then power is that good, makes me richer. So I need that power as well. So Machiavelli then tells us in chapter 17, a good prince must appreciate that humans are ungrateful and not take a thank you, an appreciation for granted. So, he says, never trust heaps of praises because under, underneath it's not just sweet talks. There's a needle in the sweet talk. And if you become this careless that the people you transform will forever become grateful, then you are losing. But because of this, you have to maintain oneself in a cautious mode. And that cautious mode pushes you towards not being good. You must be cautious. You must be unreadable, unreadable. You must understand that all that sounds and looks good, it's simply because there is a ploy. And if you do not read this ploy, it will be too late. Never take appreciation for granted. Never take anything for granted. You will be far and speedy in losing your power. And so, a good prince should not risk falling prey to deceptive self-seekers. If you fall prey, then they will take advantage of you. But it goes on to say, don't trust friends. Don't trust allies. Because they can easily betray. Instead, be vigilant. be vigilant. And for those who betray you, you don't have to be clouded with some moral sentiments of forgiveness. You must act and timely. 
Now, acting and timely implies a certain conversation. A conversation of In the language of Machiavelli, killing. Because the very competent are your problems. Excellence is not important in politics. When you have an ally, when you have one of your ministers, one of your friends so competent, he attracts publicity. He attracts appreciation. He attracts confidence. And as he attracts, you are losing confidence. You are losing publicity. And when you have such a competent person near you, it dims you up. So you must be wary about competence. And so, instead of choosing competence, you rather choose loyalty. However stupid the person is, <laughs> however unthinkable he is, Provided he is loyal. Loyalty is to your advantage. A loyalty that is unquestioned. So much so that the person loyal to you does not have a head of himself. I mean a head for himself. Instead, he has your mind. So that then, instead of saying, I think, he says, we think. My boss thinks. Competence creates individuating an individual. You become part, far apart from me. And you have a mind of your own. When you have plenty of people with minds of their own, how can you govern them? They become ungovernable. Rather, you must have total loyalty. That you have a group, you have a people who don't have a mind for themselves. They have your mind. And think your thoughts. And so we say, not I think, but we think. The we is actually you in the collectives of all of us. We've agreed. We've thought. But it is you as multiplied yourself all through around them. In that way, you are able to retain your power. Already we say such a, such a person that you've confronted or learned is not towing the line, you kill. And so he creates two characters in a prince. The lion and a fox character. A good prince must behave like a lion. Why a lion? A lion believes in strength and uses strength and uses force to the maximum. It is observed that the French Revolution could not have happened during the reign of Louis XIV. But it happened during the reign of Louis XVI. Why? Louis XIV 
had a lion-like character. And no nonsense in that case. Believed in force and power. But Louis XVI was a bit uh, uh, inconsistent at a certain point featuring as a lion, at another point like a uh, huh? uh, a cat, very humble, a cat, mm. a cat or a sheep, a bit humble and uh, oh yeah, and and and. And that became a problem. This inconsistency gave way to the revolution because it showed these weaknesses. So, Machiavelli argues the issues of the day shall not be resolved by fine speeches Blood, blood and iron. This was Bismarck. Bismarck was simply being Machiavellian. And that is exactly what Machiavelli did say. A good prince must learn to be a liar. But there are situations that when you behave like a lion, you create and you generate and you invite blames on you. We begin to mark, we begin to profile you as a dictator, as a brutal person. And that can also uh, 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 undermine your power. So there are situations that you have to behave as a fox. and have a fox character. Now, the symbolism of a fox is that which is cunning. You have to be cunning, undetectable. It's not me who did whatever happened. We come and we all uh, uh, bark. We all blame what happened, but I know what happened. So at the end of the day, you create an ambivalence around you. We do not exactly know who caused what, but something is done and I'm very happy. But I should not show that I am the one. I must have a smart way of dealing with some complex issues that does not require a lion character. One of them is keeping promises. At the time of ascendance to power, you have a number of interested parties who are also very useful on your way to power. You are fighting your way to power. They can help you. And you can instrumentalize them. In other words, you can use them as instruments or tools. So what do you do? You promise all of them something. You'll be the vice president, you'll be my vice president. You'll be my prime minister. I'll promote you to a general and on and on and on and on. Being foxy. And everybody is happy and they're busy working for you. As soon as you get your interest or your interest is taken care of, abandon the promises. Because you never intended the promises in the first place. It was a technique of ascending to power. And you needed these men who are actively involved in helping you to ascend to power. Keep them interested, oil their interests and ego, and once you've succeeded, don't keep the promises, especially when the promises are not in your interest. What happens when they begin to make noise thereafter? You have to keep them quiet. You have to silence them. And it gives you the different ways of silencing, including money, including property, and for those that are very difficult, 
uh, to manage, you find another way to take them to, to heaven. <laughs> because if, 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 if you don't do that, this complaint, you see this man walking, it's me who made him the president. You see this man, uh, you know, uh, it's me who... So you, you, you create commotion around my power. So I have to do something. If money cannot keep you quiet, I send you to, to heaven. So, on the whole, Machiavelli loves deception. This is the fox character, deception. And he argues is more rewarding than honesty. You can't be honest when the economy is not doing well. You can't be honest when your soldiers are being killed. You can't be honest when the opposition are planning something else. You must speak in tongues. You must have a double, or a double character, or a double speak. You are saying A, but not meaning A, you are meaning something else. Deception is a technique of governing. Even at home, chances of you telling the truth to your wife is very difficult that you don't have money. You tell Sadama, um, uh, everything is okay. Um, everything is okay. Don't.
You must have weak neighbors. You must have weak citizens. Citizens who think not like you only, but thinks your thoughts. A citizen who thinks your thoughts. A citizen who says, boss, as I said, quite bureaucratic. And a citizen who does not respect you only, but fears. And Machiavelli talks about whether to be respected or to be feared. I invite you to read The Prince. And he does say, it is more strategic and more sustainable to be feared than respected. When people respect you, they will take you for granted. Instead of shaking your hand, they want to tap your shoulder. They will give you funny names. La Paimol. Instead of, instead of calling you president, they will call you La Paimol because they are so familiar with you. Respect creates some familiarity, but fear creates a distance. And you supervise that distance. Because fear creates not only distance, but level of timidity. I remember during a means time, if we were taking a marua, and then somebody started to say, but you see, a mean is very bad. People will leave the marua. <laughs> said, I, I still have young children. <laughs> that is not respect, that is fear. And Machiavelli would say, ooh la la, it should reach that point. So the stories that you read in the darkness at noon, and the, uh, and the Big Brother, 1984, comes to this point, that an effective leader must be feared in the representation of the Big Brother. He is watching, he is seeing wherever you are up to the Marua group. You are talking about I mean, ah, 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 this Marua absent. The last section of our presentation is, is that so? Can we sustain the Machiavellian tradition Can we sustain the Thomistic tradition, or I mean rather Obesian uh, tradition, Thomas Hobbes? Can we sustain the idea of a superman? <laughs> to help us go through this as the last section, I hope you'll be a bit uh, uh, a person with me. We are going to read a book by Arend Anna, and the title of the book is Hashman in Jerusalem. Hashman in Jerusalem. Adolf Hashman. In German, it's not Hman, but Hashman. Hashman is a result of a Machiavellian Adolf Hitler. He is manufactured and produced as completely loyal. And as a loyal officer of the Nazi party, Schustafel, Schustafel, SS, was notorious for masterminding what you would call the Auschwitz. The Auschwitz were extermination camps inside the Poland created after 1939 when Poland was invaded. And it is this invasion that created the World War II. Uh, 
Heisman was notoriously loyal and he was the brain behind sending millions of the Jews to their death. And he did, he did that. And he grew through the ranks in terms of promotion. But on 8th May 1945, Nazi Hitler Nazi or a German Nazi was defeated. Hitler most likely committed suicide. We say most likely because this is what the mainstream literature tells us. But there are also other narratives, but we stick to that. And Hajman himself fled to Argentina. But on 11th May 1960, the Israeli Mossad captured him and brought him to Jerusalem to face trials of genocide. And these trials started on 11th April 1961. And to cover this trial was a young, beautiful lady herself a German Jew, a Jew, a German Jew, who narrowly escaped, but escaped to USA. And she got interested in the trial and requested to go and cover the trial for the New Yorker. New Yorker was a magazine. And a series of uh, trials that she, uh, you know, uh, covered ended up into a book. And the title of the book is Heishman in Jerusalem, published in 1963. Arend Anna is in the courtroom and fixes her eyes and her minds on this gentleman called Heishman. But before entering the courtroom, she had a mind, she had an attitude, she had a perception about Hashman. Could he be a lion? It's only lions who devour to that level. Could he be an evil spirit? It is only evil spirits who can do such amount of evil. How could such a person send millions of or thousands of people to their death? In actually here we would say, is this a person OBB? This must be a scary creature. And so Psychologically, Arena Anna is prepared to see this scary creature. He could not be a human person. He could not be a human being. But to her surprise, Hanschman is putting on a coat. He has a beautiful tie with reading glasses to confirm that he was a scholar. And in his defense, he was citing a number of books, including the book written by Carl Smith, Political Theology. And in that book, Carl Smith had argued that effective leadership is one whose past is one who behaves like a sovereign God. He himself is God, but secularized. There is the religious God, and this is a secular God. By implication, he was magnifying Hitler. He was celebrating Hitler. All of this, and he is famed as the father of a systematic political violence and real politics. 
as a good student of Niccolo Machiavelli. Machiavelli did not teach him, but he read Machiavelli. Anna Aren wonders. This gentleman cites powerful and very difficult to read books with lots of ease. He is a good mind. He is a good scholar. He is handsome. That's what a lady sees in a gentleman as well. He is handsome. How? What happened? Such a handsome man kills in thousands. What went wrong? And of course, as she was pondering, it was clear on 15th December 1961, Hanschman was sentenced to death. And indeed he died. Okay, he, he was killed. Not that he died, he was killed. Sentenced to death. 15th December, slightly before Christmas. On a number of accounts, crimes against humanity, crimes against the Jewish people, and war crimes. Around Anna is not satisfied, and she is asking, where is the problem? This man is not a murderer. I refuse. Because this amount of killing, something else. And Anna Arain begins to make that which is evil, thinkable. Arain, like a good scholar, does not rubbish, does not judge. Well, it is evil, as it were. But it is thinkable. It is this bad, but it is thinkable. We have to think through this evil of Heinzmann. Where is the crime of Heinzmann? Anna Arendt says it is not the killing of thousands of Jews. That is not his crime. Well, he did it, and he has been sentenced to death. But his crime is not the killing. Something else is bigger than the killing. That you could kill with ease. Meant you had reached a point of being unconscious. You've reached a point that nothing is good and nothing is evil. And that point where you don't see anything good anymore, and you don't even see what you are doing is evil, what you are doing is bad, Aaron says, Heinzmann had reached a point of thoughtlessness. That the crime of Heinzmann was not the killing. His real crime was thoughtlessness. Heinzmann was so loyal to command. Heinzmann was so loyal to the mind of the sovereign, the mind of the leader, the mind of this powerful politician that he left his mind probably in his bedroom. Heinzmann had not carried his mind anymore. And so he was commanded. To kill, so he killed. To annihilate, so he did. To collect all these subhumans as they were referred to, the Israelites as subhuman, and other Slavs and on and on, all in a train, the concentration camp, to be exterminated. He did with lots of loyalty. Where was his head? 
he left it in the bedroom. Can't you think no he had been a degenerated to a level that nothing was bad, nothing was evil, nothing was good. Aaron Anna says that is the level of thoughtlessness. So the real crime, the real evil of Heinzmann was thoughtlessness. He had become so loyal to the system. He had become so much of the system that he could not think for himself. And what created this thoughtlessness? Imagine, before we name this, imagine there is a demonstration. And then you have people going. We go, 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 we go. You will also join, no? With a stone in your hand, you see people throwing, you also throw. It turns out to be good exercise anyway. You see people rapping, you also uh, you join. You see people killing, you also join. Bandwagon. Being a part of a system A system that is moving, and you move with the system. We saw this in LRA, Lost Resistance Army. We saw this in Revolutionary United Front in Sierra Leone. We see this, or we saw this, among the Hutu killing the Tutsis. Njirim Kazi. I'm going to work. What is this work? Killing a Tutsi is work. And all able young men, let's go. We go, we go, pick a machete, we go. Where is your head? Back in the bedroom. What happened to your head? You are mobilized. You are framed to a point that you are no longer conscious and you are outside the realm of good and evil. You are now in a space of a value neutral. At that point, you are thoughtless. And Anna Ren says that the problem of being thoughtless or thoughtlessness is a result of a certain system that simply moves a certain system that simply orders, a certain system that requires conformity. Because the sovereign decides and designs and requires a total commitment to the system. And so you are part of it. And you turn out to left your head in the bedroom or behind, whatever, uh, wherever. And simply, you are thoughtless. Anna Arain pays particular attention to the problem of bureaucracy. One of the arguments of Heinzmann was, I was under superior orders. My superiors told me to do what I did. And in the army, you obey orders. But that's not only in the army. Aren then begins to see that the problem of thoughtlessness characterizes the problem of our times. Evil has pervaded our societies to an extent that the master morality has no distinction of good and evil. And the will to power uses us, uses you and I as stepping stones. But before we are used, we should be mobilized to lose our thoughts and we become thoughtless. 
and we are ready as killing machines. In the names of obeying orders, in the names of obeying systems. At that point, Anna Ren says, then I conclude. He who commits evil as a result of being thoughtless has committed evil without being evil. So the famous phrase that Anna Arane leaves us with is committing evil without being evil. The tragedy of committing evil without being evil. How come you are mobilized to commit evil? It was not essentially who you are. But you've been degenerated to that point. Like Hanschman. Professor Daniel has uh, presented this lecture. But I have a question, uh, Professor. Uh, it's in form of uh, one you the highlight. What would you say? Because you have been speaking about the notion of evil, being evil. And uh, I read something you said, uh, don't be evil without being evil yourself. Now, then we go with your spirit. What is your say on this notion of the media versus evil? In terms of uh, the talk of thoughtlessness, the media, in my perception, sometimes makes us to become thoughtless in a way that uh, we end up thinking something is evil because we get that from the media. At the end, we do things that are evil uh, without really thinking that we are evil. So what is your to create certain mentality and uh, through giving false information? Now, the whole belief, based on what people know, because today in Gulu, I have lived in a church now, next year I will be making 20 years. Many people in the surrounding villages, if you will find somebody telling you, yes, it is like that, I had a mega. What mega says becomes like the ultimate truth. In fact, if mega says today that you see Daniel, stole 5 million in good university and he is going to be prosecuted and yet you are busy in your office doing everything. Everybody will believe that is the, the truth. And uh, therefore, uh, this is what I told I should mention. So there are very many evil going on in the world just because people have believed in certain things because of the, because of the media. And we end up committing evil, harming ourselves just because of the beliefs we picked just by believing what we saw in the media. The last example we we'll give is the media history. In all of us, I'm very sure we were alive at that time. There were very many videos that were displayed on international uh, media outlets which we are showing convoys of armored personnel carriers and different sophisticated people that we are meant to destroy a whole city by a certain leader. But this we are just being created and we are being aired on all international channels to show and create a reason and a scapegoat to be able to do certain things. And at the end, they did what they wanted, but the whole world had believed so that this was what is going to happen and this is what is happening. 
So I wish to stop there. Please, uh, you will have a mention on this thing. Thank you very much. Any other question? Hey, thank you very much, Professor Dali, for your presentation. I'm by name is Lodian Patrosi. I want to agree with your presentation that how to become people, but across our society. So, it's the right time for us to have this discussion. Just like how to be people, the person really to us. We are worried how to be how to speak evil. That's why I was really so attentive. But in the same way, I want to find it. In the same way, when people are told to rest in peace, they don't want to rest in peace. So it's better we also learn how to be evil. <laughs> hey, this is a hodgepodge. It's a mixture of many things. But it helps us to really analyze these leaders, their intentions, whenever we, we try to get into those systems, whenever people say we are going into elections, we need to follow up those parameters that this person called within good and the bad. Because there are those people who hide their intentions, they just hide it beneath and they all show the other part. So it is right to have this. Many of them say they are using, they are actually customized the apple that they use the word cow and the stick. And yet it is about evil. Thank you so much. Professor. Um, we're going to take two more questions, but I'll pray be very, very brief and when we are asking or we are making a comment. Thank you, Professor. I'm good to your focus. My name is Rocky Menoyo. I'm a history teacher. Now, the question goes along what you think about how thoughtlessness is created or guided against in the religious institutions. Because at the beginning of your presentation, you said morality rests with the church. And power and all of the surrounding evil things well separated rest in politics. But we also know that there is a lot of politics in the church. Those leaders, how they get elected to become the topmost, some of them have the influence of the head of state. And sometimes I think that the head of state um, as a way to create thoughtlessness in the church, insofar as they go to the post. When the head of state came here and was looking the whole of the Caribbean with his daughter, his wife, and uh, you know the massive convoy of the army uh, coming to pray, I wondered a lot. They um, Jesus would have done the same thing with that army. So my question is. How is the church guarding against thoughtlessness? Or oh, actually using it in a certain way. Maybe they, they, they use the Bible, the, the things that the people who go to church actually also don't think. They don't question the other side of the Bible. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are getting done. I think some of us questions just to My name is. Uh, Daniel. And uh, Prof. Daniel, you, you have just succeeded at covering the minds I gave. You have, you have succeeded at, of course, with your powers, succeeded at mingling with my permission and also intelligence. <laughs> and must confess that I want to be a master of Because 
looking at the con con contemporary issues, you realize that the words you just uttered in this room are very relevant up to date. And we want to use this example. World over, eight of states are elected. Whether in the process of their election, they become somewhat killing assassins, they pick elections, they scare other, you know, electorate or militarize the process. The leaders of morality, which in your words, you say are specifically the child. Now come in at the last moment and say, we are swearing in the head of state. It is very unproper. It is therefore that today I have also understood the words of Napoleon when he said, men are led by mere toys. That when you call a man a lieutenant general, when you call a local man in that originality that a chief, you are creating that thoughtlessness you talked about. Prof, if I am to award you, I would simply award you by requesting me to officially recruit me to be a student of much faith. Because establishing such an historicity is evident enough that even when we think we do not want to be evil, we find our way ourselves in one way or the other becoming evil. So I am ready to be evil and I want to be prepared to be evil. I thank you very much. Oh my god. So I think that we got a lot of questions. Still get interesting. We shall be a name for you in brief. We are ready to return. Thank you so much, Professor Daniel. I'm going to thank you for your suggestion. I think on my behalf, it is today that I can appreciate the way the, the way the likes of Jesus Christ build their way into power. So, but in the context of being evil, how does one? apply that kind that man have in a way in a purely democratic state where all the all the rules are there that govern that define your 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 levels of action, how you should react in certain situations. The rules are already there and your tenure of office is is already established. How do you apply that Mahavidya that is my question. Thank you. So we are going to follow up that. How people are so good. You know, the ladies are not to know that I'm not to know that I'm not I'm not to know that I'm not to know that I'm Thank you so much, Papa, for the wonderful message. Uh, it was quite interesting, mostly for the politicians, because I believe that's where I think it's mostly applied. But however, I wanted really to say uh, the point of saying you should, okay, as you practice evil, mostly in politics, that God should die. Like when you actually started, you mentioned that point that you should let God die uh, in order maybe to win in a political arena. But why must God die in order as one of the evil ways? Maybe as a leader to practice that. I need more clarification on that. What are the benefits of letting God to die? Because at one point I think God will really be as well. So secondly, um, you say uh, 
as you okay, as you're in your politics, you should actually be able to your fellow sponsors, your competitors. But uh, I see this mostly in the history. For example, those kingdoms that succeeded, those are the people who were actually assassinated through their evil ways. As you say, you should practice various ways to actually eliminate anyone who may come and destroy most of the assassinations, maybe other means. But I think when you try to do that, they may also plan to do other ways. Maybe they will also assassinate you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pro, for having given us a deep and educative insight. My name is Amkul Fahad Aziz, a student faculty of law. I appreciate your deliberation. Uh, I had so many things from your speech that I always but unfortunately, the time is not on our side. Therefore, I'm going to discuss the limits. Now, our uh, prof, once uh, the Parliament of the UK posted uh, President Barack Obama when he was in power, and uh, the speaker by then made a very important quotation where he said, and I relate that quotation to the subject matter of discussion tonight, he said that a history is not a burden of any one man or one alone, but a special share of its challenges is only given to a few. And who are the few? The few are those who are willing to take it. Today we have come, we have learned to become evil, and quite a slot of us who want to become politicians in the near future. Therefore, in that case, it is up to you to either be evil or not to be evil. But if you're not going to be evil, from my prophet, the prophet has given us, you are going to crumble under the crack of the wheel. Therefore, uh, ladies and gentlemen, prove if you may allow me, I would like to respond to my sister. I know you're also going to respond on the issue of the death of God, and that is by none other than Friedrich Nietzsche himself. When you look at the work of Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, good and evil, the idea of how to be uh, the death of God came about, you realize that. Uh, in, in the rise of modernity, or oh, the movement that was called postmodernism. The rise of this uh, movement, it is doing away with the traditional ideas. And man cannot be separated from those traditional ideas. When we talk about traditional ideas, we're talking about the Bible or the Quran, what those books talk about. When we realize the establishment of certain churches in the United States of America, it's trying to sh show us a, a, something like a dollar shift from um, the old to the new. And therefore, the eradication of traditional ideas like the religious idea, that in itself is a metaphorical difference that uh, the old ideas is dying. God is dying that we die. So I wouldn't want to take more time. Therefore, let me make a uh, I have uh, three criticisms of the work of Nicole McAvey himself, the prince. Uh, the first one. I don't agree with Makabele also on grounds that when you, when you undertake a deep scan of political uh, philosophies like Gandhi's or the 1960 uh, movement, the Martin Luther King movement in the United States of America, they use peaceful means. They never advocated for violence. And therefore, that is showing you that Nicole uh, 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 Makabele's idea has postulated in uh, a prince itself. It's, it's not supreme in our uh, political waters. And secondly, I would like to clarify on the issue of uh, how to be evil. The moment I get that inference, yeah, how to be evil, it's a metaphorical inference. If you try to understand evil as you understand it, uh, you're not going to arrive at the right understanding of the word how to be evil in that sense. You have to look at it, it is more descriptive than definitive. If you're going to be finding it, you cannot really understand this uh, thing for today. And uh, lastly, uh, the assertion that the end justifies the means has never really been effective for us to bring in attainance of power. I don't know. It is up to you whether you are agree or not. And the last at last. The prince is a satire of uh, monarchical, monarchical governments. The republic. So, what I'm trying to say here is that when you look at the prince itself, when you look at the setting and the times when the prince was written and published in that regard, this one time when the when, when Roman Empire had already fallen, just as Prophet put it, of 
course, our Lorenzo Benedici was coming to establish the Medici Empire in the Latin Gang. So, to win favor of the Medici, he had to write a book as an advice based on his political experience by then. But there are certain critics by commentators which I also agree with. They are saying, when you look at uh, the book of the prince itself, as Nicolo Macabelli described in the work, he wrote the prince to rulers of principalities in the exclusion of republics. When you look at the current establishment, we are under republics, not principalities in that regard. When you look at this, about principalities, it is under, 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 under kings in that regard. They are not under kings. They are under politicians and presidents in that regard. Therefore, that statement alone, in a sense, it tries to render the while the prince itself obsolete uh, in, in certain sense, though so we cannot entirely run, run away from the tea theme of the work. The prince by the way, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Luke Benson, okay, the young fellow student. First of all, I disagree with my brother. By saying that it does not agree on the principle of Kenya's final means. I must confess, I must say, all the political leaders in the world use these very principles to attain power. The principle stipulates a ruler should be willing to use any means necessary to achieve and maintain power. That's the principle of the Kenya's final means. And this is what happened on planet Earth by all the rulers. Qualifying the Machiavellian theory, and then the book called The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, out of pain and out of pain power. Rule 32, all law 32 says, play with the fantasies of people if you want to sustain power. This means what the professor was saying the false character, the kind, the manipulation, and the deceptive. You, you tell people what they want, and if you read a book by Daniel Kahn, which says how to influence people and how to win friendship, truth, and if you read that very part, it says the truth is often avoided because it is actually an unpleasant. What does it mean? You need to play with people's fantasies, and that is the end, justify the means, do whatsoever necessary to attain power. So, I think that's the primary rule that a politician must use to sustain, to attain, to maintain and acquire power. My question goes to Professor. Uh, I'm a law student. And there's a saying in law that a good lawyer knows the law. A better lawyer knows where to find the law. But the best lawyer knows the judge. <laughs> and this qualifies the hymn of theory. Because by knowing the judge, the means you're not going to do the good things to win the case. You must be a strong lawyer. But now, my question direction says, by being evil, must you compress the law in order to rule people? Or like a ruler or the political leader, must he or she compress or contravene or contravene the, the constitution or the statutes? That direct, that direct of people in order to rule the world. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Master T. I'm a counselor from the city division. Uh, mine is not a question. Because I'm in agreement uh, with the presentation of Professor Adam. Uh, what I would want Professor to tell us with is he should give us, if possible, he should give us a simple framework of how to be evil. Because our society, for us in politics, right now is hard to penetrate because uh, the young people who constitute the majority uh, in 
the state of hopelessness and this has been inflicted deliberately by those who are ruling us, not only the president, but also our leaders in our different issues. Thank you. I think you're summarizing here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Daniel. I'm a Roman Edward. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, I want to agree with uh, the principles of uh, Machiavelli. But uh, one thing I would want to observe is uh, these principles are associated with a very high level politics, especially at the level of state power or when a state uh, is pursuing uh, its interest, both internally or internationally. Again, where it can be uh, cases where the Central Intelligence Agency of the US are directly is previously classifying the data that in the so and so to secure a very valuable and so forth. So the question I'm asking is we students who are getting this uh, knowledge at a very young age and at the at the at the at the time, the time how can we nurture and grow in this knowledge? Because if you take it more about to be interested in and I tend to go back to value. But there are high chances of destroying the brain who could be a better political ally in the future. So we need to be guided along that line to apply it appropriately. Then secondly, it's true that the world is very evil, as you have mentioned. Uh, as African people, we have witnessed the, 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 the evilness in, in the world's population. People have been sold and they have never come back. People have been killed in order to grab their resources and some of the worst continues to go on. But we continue to see that the black race has totally failed to wake up amidst all this evil strategy they want to Do that Justify in every element the, the narrative by white supremacy that Africa is perhaps you know, a lower form of humanity or homo sapiens, the biologists would call it. Because how can you be persecuted for a very long time, but you fail to rise up and defend your own?
is such evil. I don't know whether that is also cited in the Bible. Uh, so my only issue is that do we still have a clear definition of evil? Do we still have the, the Bible language of good and bad? Thank you. Can people be eliminated? Can people 
And I did say that it is at this point that evil is committed. Like Aaron Anna, she was able to transcend the physical, the physicality of a violence, the killing, the death, still asking the question, where can I locate the crime? And she located the problem of thoughtlessness. The phraseology of committing evil without being evil. It's also dramatic. It does tell us to go beyond the action and look at the vulnerability. And to her, Hashem was vulnerable because he was mobilized and degenerated to thoughtlessness. And we want to assume that you become evil when you degenerate into thoughtlessness. And as far then I come to our brother here, thoughtlessness, if you stretch it, as a social theory of evil. Then it has the history, you can create a genealogy around that. We saw the colonial thoughtlessness towards the colonized. And uh, they went into a killing spree. Some of you read Joseph Conrad, The Art of Darkness, and many more. In a sense, uh, celebrating the killings of the Africans. It was part of the system that was moving and produced and regenerated thoughtlessness. Today it leads with us. The phenomenon of thoughtlessness that creates us into evil men, evil women, leads with us. The case in northern Uganda, Babalali, when you listen to the narratives, the Balalo are our problems. Balalo are the reason, or they are the reason why we are poor. Are we mobilizing ourselves into some purposes around the Balalo? And if it is Stabilize. Then there is a research for violence from the narrative, from our perception. We need to think through that, and that's why we're saying we need to have an amicable solution here. This is a site for producing thoughtlessness, and even he who may not hold a machete may hold a machete, not that he is a killer, even when he killed, but that he was mobilized into this problem of thoughtlessness. How do we categorize evil, the problem of categorization of evil? It's difficult because, again, it's also constructive, and so it's constructive. And in a sense, in the continuum, 
of shifting or moving from wrong to evil, we assume that that which is beyond wrong, both of them are moral questions. Wrong is a moral question, and evil is a moral question, especially one secularized, uh, not the church aspect of evil. So all of them are in the continuum of morality. But we qualify that as extraordinary for now. But still the categorization can go on so that we get a more stable understanding of what evil. So in that case, euthanasia, we still place it as a wrong. It's an ethical wrong. It's a professional wrong. But it has not yet transcended into evil because we think it's not extraordinary. But again, that's another problem. Black consciousness. Why do we allow uh, to continue uh, suffering wrongs and evil, but particularly evil? Again, as we think of that, we should also realize the colonial durability, deploying new uh, you know, methods of keeping us uh, unconscious. One of them is the television we watch. Europe is always beautiful, we admire and we want all to be there. The cosmetics we, 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 we use, particularly our sisters, uh, white is beautiful, so you want to paint yourself. And, uh, and then the men also admire brown, uh, you know. Uh, the act of browning. Browning is another concept that uh, we need to uh, say. So, whiteness is continuously becoming superior. So, the durability, colonial durability is there. A framework of how to be able, uh, brother. Uh, uh, probably I needed to say this from the beginning. Uh, maybe together we, we pray that we do not produce a framework of evil, but that we should be conscious about evil. So we are building more consciousness towards evil and how evil actually comes and operates to an extent that you commit evil without being evil. So we are, we are in a sense limiting framework of evil but uh, enhancing consciousness around evil. In other words, to show that this is how bad, particularly when we started with a, a, a mainstream idea of real politics, which is about gaming. Politics is game, and part of the game is killing. You can kill a person as a, an opponent, you can kill a people as a race or an ethnic group, that's genocide. All these are within the trajectory of a power competition. So we are saying this framework needs to be reduced by creating consciousness around evil. Should lawyer, I agree, and thank you. Uh, yes, uh, you, you and uh, my colleague, and all of us has uh, uh, told me probably we need a reading group and probably uh, the society can take on that. Uh, we are regular and serialized. We can go into classical readings. The Plato, Aristotle. Uh, maybe we start with Egypt, Egyptology. Then we come on, on, Arena Anna, somebody loves it, uh, Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, and many more. Uh, I would be happy. Yes, so, but the point here is, as you have shrewd lawyers, the ruler, the shrewd ruler, must also know his people and know their fantasies. When they when they love God, you put resources there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then they will forget critiquing you. If they love uh, Ndombolo Yasolo, put money there. Let's keep them dancing. And they'll forget about uh, power. So that's what a shrewd ruler must know these people. If they like Bwakata Tonto or uh, Lira Lira or, uh, uh, or Marua, uh, uh, keep them there. And so that then uh, you have a. And we've seen this working in, in, uh, uh, in the Yetis. 
the price of a bottle of beer is probably half cheaper than in the, the main store. Why is it cheaper? Oh, yeah, they cannot afford, that's the reasoning. But the whole point is that you can drink more. And when you drink more, you become more silly and then you cannot grow and we keep you there. So, our title, How to be Evil, I love what you say, it was simply descriptive, not definitive. Uh, it was heuristically pointed uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to a sort of a satire uh, to uh, arouse us. We expected many more people, but um, that's okay. This is already good enough. I'm happy. Is it still possible to have Machiavellian politics in a civilized society? Yes, pretty much. We know now. Election is one of the civilized uh, criteria, but we can still assault the vote counting. With these uh, machines around, we can have an expert and instead uh, stop the machine from working or dememorize the machine. So, uh, there are also civil ways of, of remaining Machiavellian. <laughs> God must die. I think that was answered. The whole idea is forget about religion and morality because these are, in a sense, uh, it's, it's a metaphor to, in a sense, show that religion and morality originates from this, uh, this figure called God. So if you don't want morality to trouble you, you don't want religion to trouble you, you have to destroy the source, and the source is God. So how do you kill God? Retrench him, retire him, ignore him, you go for coffee, then you have no problem. Now, not that you don't have a problem, but you decide if you don't have any problem, no noise about God around you. <sighs> Democratic state, yes. Is it still possible to be Machiavellian? Pretty much. Because demo, which means people, and criteria, which is rule ruled by the people. So what you happen, uh, what you do is you release uh, stable normative principles. And then you say people decided, people decided we, we all want to walk naked on the streets of Gul. That's democracy, then we would walk. Like they said, crucify him, crucify him. That was a bigger noise, that was democratic. And the pilot had to say, oh la la, there you are. So, democracy has created a post-truth. Because post-truth is the idea that nothing holds, everything is right and true, provided people are happy with it. So, the impact of democracy is post-truth. In Europe now, it's very difficult to stand and say they want to be president, but no to homosexuality, you will not win. So you got to say, yeah, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, yeah, mm, yes, God knows, but I need to pass. Okay, homosexuality, correct. So democratization process has a creative post-truth. And this is also partly the reason of the war between the Christians and the Muslims. The Christians, the you know, dissented good. They fail politics. You remember in the Bible when the Israelites said we also need a king, and God was fairly not happy with that. He said this is awful, but the Israelites insisted we need a king. In, in the Muslim world, the emphasis political theology the combination of a policy, a politics and a fail. God must be in politics. God must be in uh, all that we do. The Western world, and that's what they brought to us, is political theory. Human mind crafts, creates political systems because we are intelligent. The Muslim world are saying, no. It is political theology. Politics must be theologized. In other words, according to 
what uh, the Holy Books do tell us. Lastly, very lastly, uh, yes, it started with the question of media. We saw media in Rwanda providing a momentum to gain and retain, to displace, gain and retain power. So media plays a role. And media behaves also in a Machiavellian way. What do we do? We need to embarrass the other side we are contesting power with. We need to demonize them. Where is the responsibility when matters of power is concerned? Uh, uh, journalistic profession is put aside. And the uh, role, sense, and sensitivity of a power emerges. And that's why Machiavellian. So, mediatize this information. It, it, it works in the hands of those who are wrestling power to realign thoughts in a particular way. And when you misinform people, you deal and franchise them, and they become less thinking, and they become thoughtless, and they become zombies. Is it zombies? And they walk with you as you want. Let's definitely. Thank you very much, Professor. I personally, I think I have a lot of come to call it. So we have come to the end of our public lecture today. I'm not the one going to close, I just want you to know that we are finished. Um, I want to encourage each one of you to always come because I believe last time we learned a lot about our nutrition and food and today we are learning a lot about um, politics and power and I believe well, this just expands your knowledge beyond what you put in class and beyond your field of profession better adapt to suit in your world better so um, I would like to call the first day of Open Minds Society to come and close for us. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Thank you very much, Prof, uh, for the messages, for diving deep into my family and many other scholars. Um, thank you also to you, the participants, for many minutes up to this hour. <laughs>